Well, thank you again for inviting me back. I want to thank Vincent and the leadership of KCM uh, for their ministry here. And it's good to uh, see my brother Nathan earlier and shake his hand and greet him again. Uh, back uh, in May, I enjoyed our time here after uh, our talk. Uh, we went to get a bite to eat at Jason's Deli, and I, I remember that. And had some uh, additional fellowship and over, over sandwiches and soup. Uh, my prayer for you for this year is that you would have a great ministry. I know the school year has just started, but I do pray and hope that your ministry would touch many, many lives with the gospel as already been mentioned by others. Now, the big question for the University of Maryland this year, of course, by this next PowerPoint you see, is whether you think, uh, okay, the next one. <laughs> whether, whether you think this uniform is the thumbs up or thumbs down, that's the big question. How many of you think this uniform is thumbs up? No. <laughs> How many of you think it's thumbs down? Okay. A little more thumbs down, all right? So, uh, I hear that... Uh, Coach is having them go to a different uniform this weekend, but they got their publicity for sure uh, through last week's game. Now, how was your summer? You know, it's hard to hard to remember. You know that just a couple weeks ago we were still in the midst of summer. Uh, for I, I hope you got to travel a little bit and spend time and just relax. Uh, how did I do this summer? I had a I had two great experiences. I've always wanted to visit Yellowstone. And I've never been there, but so finally, we got to go to Yellowstone, and we were crazy enough to actually drive it. So it was uh, 5,500 miles round trip over two weeks. And we camped overnight in South Dakota at the foot of the Mount Rushmore, and it was raining, and it was wet. So instead of camping at Yellowstone, we decided we're going to chicken out and just use a cabin instead. So that's what we did. But we visited some great national parks, and just uh, it was basically seeing mountains. But mountains are gorgeous. Mountains are so dynamic, they're ever changing. Actually, the second experience that I, I just came back uh, not too long ago, Labor Day weekend, from a family vacation with my uh, my family. I have three kids, and my oldest is married, so there were four kids, and my wife and myself. We were at Bethany Beach. Uh, a friend of ours let us use their beach house, and in the back is a canal. And you can actually drop uh, these uh, crab cages down into the canal. And so we put some chicken, you know, neck or chicken thigh in there, because so we you know crabs like that. And the, that we came, you know, we left, left it overnight and in the morning. We pulled that out. There were 15 crabs. I couldn't believe it. You know, so a couple of them had to throw back, but we ate 11 of them. <laughs> but they were decent size. Um, I really enjoy traveling now. Maybe part of it is a compensation for lack of it when I was a, a teenager and in college. Uh, I grew up in New York City, and uh, my father didn't like to travel. So living in Queens, I remember the furthest we ever went on vacation was to New Jersey. So, so, I really try to go further away now, different places. Well, one of the things I did uh, at the beach this year was I was uh, I was asked to write a chapter in a book. The book is called Real People, Real uh, Suffering, and Real Victories. And oh, this is the yellow one. Okay, yeah. And uh, um, in fact, two Korean pastors uh, who has this uh, uh, Christian publishing company just started asking me to contribute a chapter to this book. Now, why would they want me to contribute to, to their book? Because they said there are four people who want to profile. And your story about what happened in your life, a chapter in your life, so interesting and significant. We want other people to hear it. And what these Korean friends of mine were talking to was about cancer. Because I was diagnosed with cancer six years ago, and uh, but as you can see, I'm well. I'm really, really well. Okay, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But I just want to say that God has even turned such a difficult situation for me and my family into something that we can give testimony to Him, and hopefully through that book, many others will also hear of God's power. I was given the title uh, of this talk, God Not Like Us, to speak to you tonight. And the ones who gave me this title got it, I think, from a book called The 
Don't call it a com don't call it a comeback. The old faith for a new day, edited by Kevin DeYoung. And there's a chapter there called God Not Like You, written by Jonathan Lehman, who is uh, uh, on the staff at the Capitol Hill Baptist Church in here in D.C. And it's a great chapter. In fact, I like not only that chapter, I, I like the book a lot. So I even use this part of a, a Sunday school class I taught to introduce the basics of the Christian faith to others, uh, and I use that this summer. I want to read the first four paragraphs of this chapter about God not, not like you, to give you a sense and flavor of where the writers are going with this and where I hope to also dovetail in terms of uh, what I want to share with you tonight. This is how the beginning of that chapter goes. Maybe you think God is like Superman. He's basically human but has amazing powers. He likes to help people, at least if he can get there in time. He's a gentleman, well-mannered and politically correct. He never imposes himself on people's wills, and he stands for truth, justice, and all that stuff. Well, maybe you think God is like Morgan Freeman. <laughs> In one movie I saw, Freeman depicts God as a kind, older man with a grandfatherly chuckle. He's honest and caring, but he also challenges people. Happily, this, the, his harder lessons are for their good. Or maybe your view of God is not so positive. Honestly, you're a little suspicious of him. Things haven't gone well for you, and the world is too dark to expect much. We all have slightly different ideas about what God is like, and probably our backgrounds affect our view. But one thing is certain, every one of us in our natural state believes that God is pretty much like us. I mean, we believe that God is angered at the things that anger us, and treasures the things we treasure, we believe he likes the people we like and doesn't like the people we don't like. Even when we do wrong, we assume that God basically understands our course of action. He won't make a big deal out of it. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think even for those of us who grew up in the church, it's easy to begin after a while to think that God basically acts and thinks the way we do. I wasn't a Christian until I was 18 years old, and certainly as a non-Christian, when I first heard about God from some high school friends, all I could relate to God was all the human concepts I had were just magnified and multiplied. But they basically, at core, I thought that God was just a larger version of a human being. But what is the consequence if we think like this, that God is basically like us? There are very serious consequences. First of all, we would domesticate God. Tame. He becomes very tame. Something that we can control and manipulate. We can grasp and, 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 and work to our advantage. We begin to make God in our own image. We lessen who He really is and some of the difficult sayings that He presents to us and some of the different, some of the difficult concepts that He speaks to us. We begin to use our terminology to define who God is. For example, when we think about the word jealous, when we think about the word anger, God says he is both. There are times when he's very jealous, and there are times he's very angry. What do we do with those terms? Well, one way to do it is to we just simply take the human concept, clean it off a little bit, and say, well, probably God is like that. But no, those terms are very special terms. And in order for us, we can understand what God is saying by those terms. We have to understand how He uses it, not the common ways that we use those kinds of words. And when we begin to understand that God is one who defines and shapes words and meaning, and even us, when we begin to submit to Him. Now the Bible gives us many, many passages that we can enter into to see who God is and what is He like and not like. The passage I'd like to use uh, for to share with you tonight is in Job chapter 9. I came across this uh, passage I was reading in the summer and I thought, you know, this would be a good chapter uh, to use uh, for this topic, how God is not like us. And so I want to uh, share some of those verses and then draw out some implications of what, those, what that chapter says in terms of uh, uh, how is God not like us. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, or if you have your 
iPhones or whatever you, you use here digitally, Bibles, you can turn to Job chapter 9, and I'm going to read um, verses 1 to 12, and then 32 to 35, I think we'll have a PowerPoint if you, if you don't have it uh, with you. Now, as you may know, Job was a man who suffered greatly, much greater than I ever have or ever will. He lost, in fact, just about everything you can imagine. He lost his family, his kids, all of his possessions, and yet he tried to cling onto faith in God. And Job's three friends, they came to grieve with him. And for many days, they couldn't even say any words. He just cried and sat there in silence and weeping with Job. But as they started to converse, they thought, Job, you must have sinned. You must have sinned, therefore you are suffering like this. As it turned out, it wasn't because Job had sinned. After 9-11 occurred, people also asked, is God punishing us for something? Why did 9-11 occur? Why didn't God stop it? How can God allow such a tragedy to occur? Well, let's listen to this chapter again, verses 1 to 12. Let me first go through that, and then the second passage at the end of the chapter. Then Job answered and said, Truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. He who removes mountains and they, they know it not, when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun and it does not rise, who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea, who made the bear and Orion Pleiades in the chambers of the south, who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number. Behold, he passes by me, and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. Behold, he snatches away. Who can turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? And then verses 32 and 35. For he is not a man, he meaning God. God is not a man as I am. That I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I will speak without fear of him, for I am not so in myself. I want to share three things with you tonight and for you to think about. The first thing is this, that God is supremely more right than we are, and therefore we should not accuse Him of wrongdoing. God is supremely more right than we are, therefore we should not accuse Him of wrongdoing. You know, I think really there are times when we treat God as if we're on an equal plane. We might think that we are right. In fact, God is wrong. Lord, I know this is the right thing. I don't know why you didn't let me have it. And therefore, we almost accuse him like a prosecuting attorney against the defendant. In a courtroom, in fact, the parties are pretty equal. And you need a judge to serve as an arbiter, listen to both sides, hear the evidence and the arguments for and against. And then to make a determination, who is more right than the other person? But who can prepare a case to accuse God and think that he is going to win? When we accuse God, we might be thinking, oh, you might have some evil motive. Yes, therefore, is there something about you that I can't trust? There's something very devious that I can't trust in you. But does God have evil motives? If he does, he wouldn't be God. We have evil motives, or mixed motives at best. And therefore, we think that God might also have mixed motives. But that's an assumption that we make about God, not something that we have proven yet. Or sometimes we think that God is very limited in His powers, that He could have done more, but He didn't. He chose not to. But if God does not have all power, then He's not God either. God, by definition, is most right and most powerful. 
there was a <clears throat> there was a Broadway play uh, many years ago called Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. And the meaning there is that we can be complaining and dumping and venting about God and fighting Him as it would challenge Him to a match. Or, but then we realize that He is way beyond us. We can never equal Him. Our arms are too short to box with God. And that's how Job felt and his friends felt as he began to, to think through the, the mystery involving human suffering. And they try to argue against God that, Lord, you, there's, something, there's something not right here. Something, something is wrong here. You, you should not be punishing this man. And they thought they had accumulated enough arguments and evidence to convict God. But while we are accumulating our evidence and our arguments and rehearsing them against God, God is also collecting his arguments and his evidence against us. And guess who's going to win? In Job, there are many things like this. It's as if God and man are placed in the courtroom and the man is suing God for some wrong. There is legal language here in this chapter. Words like the right, contend, trial, arbiter. There are really times when it seems like people are so upset at God that they're dragging him into a courtroom to blame him for something. Think about the things that we might blame God for. When something hasn't gone right for you, have you blamed God for it? When some situation has overwhelmed you or terrorized you or terrified you, have you blamed God? Are we acting like those people who drag God into a courtroom to accuse him? But God is not a mortal that we should treat him like a mortal. And if we want to question and grill God, God also had, can, can grill and question us. In fact, in Job 38, verses 2 to 7, God asked Job some questions. He asked him this, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. To this first question, Job didn't even exist when God laid the foundations. So Job is not qualified to speak about it. To the second and third questions, who marked off the earth's dimensions? Who stretched out a measuring line across it? Again, Job wasn't there. So what, what does he know? What can he say? To the fourth question, on what were the earth's footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? Again, the answer is obvious. It's God. God laid the cornerstone, not us. So out of all these questions that God asks Job, he can't answer any of them. God was there before we existed. He is more right than we are. The second thing Job 9 tells us is this. God is infinitely more wise than us. Therefore, some things hidden from us we may never know. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. And in verse 12, who will say to him, what are you doing? If we're not accusing God of wrongdoing, we might be doing this instead. A second issue with God, that is asking him why. Why did this happen? Why did that occur? Why did my parents or friend or I get sick? Why did this person suffer? Why did I lose that person? We ask all kinds of why questions. And if you think about it, we're act people are very funny. We're very selective in the kind of questions we want to ask. There are some things we're very curious about. We want to know as much as we can. And there are some things we couldn't care less about and we would never ask any questions about them. Let me give you an example. For example, many guys are curious about fantasy football. <laughs> and they will go to no lengths to ask all kinds of questions about whom they should draft and which players and all the stats and 
but they might not be curious at all about why a girl acts in a certain way. Or some girls are very curious about why guys act the way they do. And you talk about a mystery, right? But then girls may not have any curiosity about how a car works. Now, there might be some girls who are interested in cars. Okay? She's going to come up to me and say, after the talk, you know, I'm interested in how a car works. Okay, I'll grab that. Well, do we really know why Job suffered? Do we really know why anything happens? Do you know why you're here in College Park on the campus of University of Maryland? Do you really know why? Say, well, I got decent grades, you know, and I was willing to pay, so I got here. Okay, that's one human way of looking at it. But why you? Why not your classmate who had the same grades as you and who could also pay? Why were you saved? Do you really know why? Why are you born Asian or non Asian? Do you really know why? Some questions we really don't know the answer. And we just have to accept them at face, at face value and just go on with life. And realize that maybe at some point I'll have a better answer, but for now, I don't know. And we have to learn to accept that. We so many times take steps and actions before we know the answer to the why question. And in the face of God's great wisdom, God is also saying to his people, there are times where I want you to take a step forward, even though you don't know the answer to the why. Joe finally realized that he cannot know some of these answers. And then he replied at the end of the, of the book, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I had no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Some people love to talk. Job and his friends had extended discourse, and they were thinkers, and they were talkers. But at a certain point, you reach the limit, and you just cover your mouth like Job did, and he says, I have nothing more I can say. I've run out of wisdom. When we run out of our wisdom, it's actually the beginning of God's wisdom. As long as we think we have all the answers, we will stop asking God to show us His reasons and His wisdom. There's a verse in the New Testament that addresses this as well, that as creatures, we're really limited in the things that we know. Romans 9, verse 20 says, But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? We don't know why we're made this way. We are creatures. We are created. And we accept that. And we put our hands over our mouth and say, Yes, Lord. Let me do the best I can with what you've given to me. For myself, for a period of time when I was in college, I asked this why question a lot. It was this girl I really liked. And I thought that I was going to marry her. You know where this is going, right? <laughs> well, I can share this with you now because I'm not embarrassed by it. It took about 30 years to get over the embarrassment. <laughs> But my wife knows the story, so it's not like I'm, I'm hiding anything by sharing this with you. Well, this girl that I really liked in college didn't like me the same way. She liked me as a friend, but she didn't want to marry me. And uh, I was, I, you know, I was crushed. I, I guess I was a pretty serious person, you know, so I was really crushed. And I couldn't, I couldn't accept the fact that she could only be and I was crushed. I mean, it's, it's, the kind of, it's kind of the, the crush in your spirit, losing your sleep kind of crush. I think I lived most of a year in college in the days. And I wanted to know why. 
I thought we would make a great pair. <laughs> She's a Christian. I'm a Christian. We're the same ethnic background, similar culture. We are a good fit. <laughs> with similar background. You know, my mind is like, yeah, I thought that would work. But God didn't provide a direct answer to me. Why not her? Instead, he gave me another girl who loved me. And she's probably wondering, how come I love John, but John doesn't love me, and John loves the other girl. <laughs> it took a little bit of time, but then I developed a love for this other girl, and she became my wife. Now, I'm really condensing the story quite a bit. <laughs> don't, think, don't think the next day you get married. Right? <laughs> this is only a 40 minute talk, right? And, and now we've been married for 28 years. We have three grown kids, and we have served God together, and we really have helped each other all of these years. So God has given me a great wife. God knew the answer, even though I didn't. But I learned, and I began to see what His answer was for me, and I accepted it, and has worked out. Sometimes we think we should be paired with someone. But the question is, does God think we should be paired with that person? We think we know for sure God has given me a sign it's going to be you. <laughs> we think we know you're the one. The only problem is God has been told the other person. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, it's, it's not our wisdom about thinking what is the best that determines what we receive in life. Almost all the good things you've received in life are in spite of you. It's by grace. If we were God, then what we would want would always be what we get. But since we're not God, we have to accept what God provides. Like the words in James chapter 4. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city, or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it is the Lord's will, it will be done. Are we seeking that will rather than my own will? One of the things I've been thinking a lot about, especially this year, is this idea of the American dream and how people are driven to it. And then there's a subset of the American dream that's the Asian American dream. <laughs> you know, get good education, get a beautiful wife or a handsome husband. Get a great career, make tons of money, have a house in the suburbs, two cars, and, the, and so on and so forth. The Asian American dream or the American dream, whatever it is that we're pursuing. But why are we pursuing those dreams? I'm not saying that having a, a house in the suburbs or a car is bad, but for what purpose do you want it? At what cost are you willing to pay to get it? Who is all this that you derive the benefit from? Who is it for? Maybe you can make a case that it is the pursuit of the American dream that has led to so many of the economic problems of this country and also the world. As we pursue the materialism, we've forgotten what we can really afford. We, have, we stopped asking, what is it that I, what is it God wants me to have? And we just I want, and I want, and I want. I think we're now living in an age in which people are a little more realistic. But still, there are many people who have many resources, and they have to, they're still pursuing these dreams. Why are they pursuing these dreams? Who knows best, me or God? Who am I serving, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of me? 
Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. There are certain things that God won't show you in His wisdom. He may never show you on this, in this world. But there are other things, plenty of other things that He has revealed about the purpose of life, about what we were made for, about the importance of worship and centering our lives around Him. About having His values drive us. About the importance of humility and submission. About listening rather than speaking. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is wiser than we are. The third implication that I want to share with you from this passage is this. God has abundantly more rights than we do. Therefore, God can do whatever He desires except sin. We live in an age in which we hear a lot of talk about rights, human rights, all kinds of rights. The rights of the unborn, women's rights, minorities' rights, gay rights, the rights of the accused, even animal rights. Now there is truth that we all have some rights that's given to us by God. And having a not acknowledging that there are these rights given to creatures is a way to protect them from being taken advantage of and being persecuted. But one thing I don't think I've heard people talk about is this question, is to ask this question, what rights does God have? Have you heard anybody say, ask that question? What rights does God have? And yet, the Bible basically is talking about what rights God has. Does God have the right to remove mountains or to shake the earth out of its place and make its pillars tremble? Does God have the right? Sure. He made it. Does God have the right to command the sun and seal up the stars? Sure. Does God have the right to stretch out the heavens and trample the waves of the sea? Sure. Of course He does. And he, he does this because he's the creator. He's the one that has sovereign rights, all rights. And his rights are always greater than the creatures. So God can do whatever he desires except for one thing. He cannot sin. He cannot violate his own nature. God cannot do that and that alone. He can't do anything that is sinful. He is free to do that which is mysterious. He is free to do that which is mind-blowing. We may not understand what He is doing or why He is doing it, but that's not the same thing as saying He is doing something sinful. To call something sinful requires a moral standard, an absolute standard. Do we have that standard in ourselves? No, this standard has to be outside of ourselves. Otherwise, how can you say this standard applies to everyone? If the standard is only your standard, it only applies to you and no one else. But if it's going to apply to everyone, if it's wrong to have injustice, if it's wrong to oppress, it has to be a standard outside of you so that it applies to everyone. If it only comes from you internally, you can't hold other people to it. It's personal. It's subjective. It has to be outside of you in order for justice to make any sort of sense. And in order that other people have to live up to that justice. We say God has this outside stand outside of us, but it belongs fully internally to Him. God is not like us. He has all the rights in Himself. And this concept is so important to keep people from becoming gods and tyrants. It is in, in countries of, in which they deny God, communism, socialism, in which in atheism reigns. 
that you have people slaughtering others without any sort of mercy. But in countries that has had the influence of Christianity, they need to be still are the countries that respect human rights. God is more right, more wise, and has more rights than us. And yet, and yet, the gospel is this. Even though God has more rights, yet God gave up his rights. God gave up his rights from being able to stay in holiness up in heaven. Instead, he descended into this earth, mired in sin, and in the person of Christ. He gave up his rights of his glory in order to be with us. And even though he, God is most wise, yet He has chosen to reveal to us what His wisdom is. He didn't hide it from us, which it could happen. But instead, he, sh he showed us what wisdom is in the person of Jesus Christ. He showed it to us in the form of a person. We know what wisdom is, not because it's an abstract concept, but when we see it lived out in people in a personal way. And we see that the delicate balance, the, the subtlety, the nuance, then we appreciate that is really wisdom. And then God, even though He's more right than anyone else, yet God takes our accusations that we throw against Him, and He doesn't hold it against us. Even though He's more right, He doesn't punish us for our false accusations, but He comes to our aid. He stoops to our level in order to befriend and show us the way. I mentioned that one of the things I was doing this summer was writing a chapter about uh, my cancer experience. Um, I don't even know quite where to start. It's just, uh, it could be a, a separate talk in itself, but I'll just very briefly mention this. That over five years ago, uh, I began to feel this, this sharp pain on the side of my abdomen. It turned out it was because the tumors in my body had grown to such an extent they were pushing up against my diaphragm and I was feeling this sharp pain. They quickly did uh, some emergency CAT scan and the ultrasound and so forth. And what they found in terms of tumors in me just scared the daylights out of me. I want to show you by illustration, how much tumors they found in me. Josh, right? Yes, Josh. All right, come on up. Let me, I know you're not prepared for this, but I just want to show you and give you an idea of the, of the amount of tumors they found in me. All right, face the, face the group. Okay, all right, here, Josh, let me give you this. was the amount of cancer cells they found in my body. Okay. There were three tumors. They were about three and a half inches and six of them. They were about two to three inches. So it's the equivalent of three softballs and uh, six baseballs and tennis balls. And there were some smaller ones the size of golf balls and marbles. So I had like a whole sporting equipment in my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I didn't know you could have this much tumors in you and still live. And I mean, I didn't feel it until it got so big. But, you know, the largest uh, tumor of this kind they found was 22 pounds. Okay, this is like being pregnant, right? Um, <laughs> but the amazing thing is this, and I still don't know why, okay? The cancer that I have is called GIST, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. It's a sarcoma. It's a soft tissue cancer. It starts anywhere in the, along the lines of the gastrointestinal tract. For me, it started in my stomach, and it spread into my liver. That's what they saw. 
when they did the scans, they found all these cancers and probably a little more. But there's so many stories in this that I don't know the answer to. But fortunately, there is a medicine that I can take called Gleevec, G-L-E-E-V-E-C, Gleevec. And it's effective for my kind of cancer. And it shrinks the tumors almost immediately. In three weeks. Oh, you just ran away. <laughs> okay. One tumor ran away. Okay. But in three weeks of taking Gleevec, of taking one a day, half of these, half of these tumors were gone. And then as I continued to take it, it shrank more and more until I finally got surgery. And um, the surgery was six hours long. There was a possibility, of course, I was going to die. As it turned out, they removed uh, half of my liver, uh, my gallbladder, part of my right adrenal gland, and 10% of my stomach. So after I learned that they took out so much, I, I said, I'm glad, I told the surgeon, I'm glad you left some things in there for <laughs> Um, but I'm alive, and I continue to take medicine. All right, thank you so much. All these back here. <laughs> All right, thank you. But to talk about, you know, God's rights and my right. Do I have the right to not have cancer? No. Why should I not have that right? Some people, when they found out from my, they found in my church that I got cancer, they said, "Oh, this is horrible! How can God make one of His own servants have cancer like this?" But you know, ministers don't have more rights to be kept from illnesses than other people. And it helped me to get through this difficulty to think, I don't have more inherent right than other people not to get sick. But in fact, I'm going to die one day anyway. If it's going to be this way or some other way, it's, I'm going to die one way or the other. I'm just very, very thankful and grateful to know that even though I didn't have the right not to have cancer, yet God had mercy on me. And I'm really here today to be able to talk to you and last in, back in May because of His grace. Because He wanted to sustain me. That's really the only reason. And to be able to share what God has done for me to other people, whether it's through a book or through my testimony with others. What right do I have to say that I should be cured? The medicine that I take is $200 a pill. And I have to take that every day for the rest of my life. You know, $200 times 365 days a year, you know how much that is? A lot of money. Tons of money, <laughs> yeah. $75,000 probably. But with insurance, I pay 50 cents a pill. What right do I have to pay only 50 cents for a pill that costs $200 retail? Do I have an inherent right to health insurance and other people don't? I'm just most grateful and thankful that I get to live. And the mystery, I may never know why I got to live. And our kids, our children's God father, a good friend of ours in the church, he had cancer about the same time I did and he died. Am I better than him? I don't think so. Why did he die and I live? It's a mystery. I reached a point in my life where there are just some things I, I just, it's, I want to know why, but I also realize I can't know. And I just realize that God is not like us. He can do as he chooses and as he pleases. He's very mysterious. But I know he's good. And I know 
that my Redeemer lives. And I know because of His mercy and His grace, I get to live. And that whether, whether I live here or not, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So either way, I'm okay. That brought great comfort to my soul, as you can imagine. I really know that my life is not my own. And God can do with it as He pleased. Which He always had that right in the very beginning. But it took different experiences for me to reach that same conclusion. I want to close by having you um, listen to a song. It's an old hymn. Uh, it's called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Some of you may, be, may have heard of this. It was written by a man named William Cooper um, in about 1770s. And there is a stanza in there which says, um, it says, he plants his footsteps in the sea. God plants his footsteps in the sea. And you may wonder, what does that mean? Well, when he plants his feet in the sea, that means you cannot see it. You can only see him, but you can't see his footprint. And there are times like that where you can't see God's footprint. You only know that God is there. And stuff is happening to you. There are things that are inscrutable in your mind, and you don't know why it's happening. And then the second half of the stanza in that line says, even though he plants his footsteps in the sea, he rides upon the storm. That means that God is still in control. Even though you can't see it, he is in total control. So I'd like for us to, I hope it works out with the, with the song and all. It's, uh, you don't have to sing it. I just like kind of you listen to it. This YouTube clip, and let it uh, let the words kind of sink in, uh, and uh, maybe a prayerful way to meditate upon the message, as well as how God is not like us.
Father, Lord, uh, we thank you for who you are, Lord, that you are a God who is not like us, uh, not like me and not like anyone in this world, um, that you are more than um, any of the goodness that would come out of us, um, that um, in your very nature you are perfect, um, you are the definition of love, you are the definition of um, perfection, goodness, uh, righteousness, and holiness, um, yet we fall so short of what you truly are. Um, but in your mercy and in your kindness, um, um, you decided to reconcile sinners like us um, who didn't deserve um, to be saved, who had no rights um, um, uh, apart from you, that out of your sovereign will you decide to save us. Um, Lord, we thank you for um, being a God who shows us um, perfect kindness, perfect patience, and perfect love um, um, to um, treacherous um, and wretched sinners like us. So, Lord, we thank you for being a father who loves us, um, who sent his son to die for us. Um, and now, for those who um, believe in him and trust, um, put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they are redeemed. Um, so thank you, Lord, for being a gracious God. And thank you for tonight's message. Um, as we um, get, our, get a better idea of who you really are, um, how you are a God um, who um, truly is not like us, um, who is so much more and so much better. And we pray all this in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, Pastor Tom. Pastor Tom, if I could actually ask you to come back up. Please. 